Hello friends, welcome to Dungeons & Dragonfly, where I adapt various characters for use in D&D. I'm Dragonfly9078, and today I'm building Dale Gribble. For a bit of background, Dale is a middle-aged exterminator from Arlen, Texas. In direct opposition to Hank, who we also built and who serves as the voice of reason in their group, Dale is the cause of many of the group's troubles, thanks to his impulsive nature, lack of common sense or restraint, and extreme paranoia. So, what do we want from this build? Well, Dale is a big fan of guns, and is the president of the local gun club, so we'll need some of those. We also need to be a paranoid conspiracy theorist who distrusts the government, so that'll be fun. And finally, we do need a day job still, so we'll throw a couple of exterminator skills in along with everything else. Looking over at ability scores, I'll be using the standard point array. If you want to roll for stats, that's fine, just make sure your dexterity, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma are high enough to multiclass. Starting off by dumping strength, Dale is the weakest of the alley crew, to the point where his position on their high school football team was Waterboy. Dexterity will be 12, we're moderately good at building things, and we'll make Constitution 13 to better survive the situations that we get ourselves into. Intelligence is 15, so we can see through the government's lies and find out the real truth, but Paranoid Conspiracy Theorist doesn't exactly scream high wisdom to me, so we'll make that 10. And we'll finish up with a 14 in Charisma so we can convince Bill and Boomhauer to go along with our schemes. Dale's a human, and a pretty average one at that, so we get plus one to all of our stats, and we'll take the Urban Bounty Hunter background since he is, in fact, a bounty hunter. That'll give us proficiency in Stealth and another skill, but I don't really like any of the other options for Dale, so we'll take Survival for the second. Starting off as an Artificer to get proficiency with Firearms, as well as two skills from the Artificer list, like History and Nature. We're also a magical tinkerer, letting us put sensory effects into tiny non-magical objects so they play a sound or message, display an image, give off a smell, that sort of thing. Artificers do get spells at this level, but I'll save that for the spellcasting section. Most of our classes get spells this time, so it's a little bit complicated. Second level artificers can infuse items to make DIY gear when you can't trust the standard issue stuff. No telling what kind of bugs they put in military surplus gear. We get four of these, but we can only have two active at any given time. Goggles of Night are night vision goggles that give us 60 feet of dark vision. Sending Stones are a walkie-talkie. An enhanced weapon gets plus one to its attack and damage rolls. And on the off chance we need to gnaw our own leg off to get out of a government bear trap, it would be nice to know how to make a prosthetic limb. Gotta be prepared for anything. Third level artificers are especially good at that with the right tool for the job. With an hour of work, we can jury rig up a set of artisan's tools. They aren't magical and last until we need to use the pieces to make another set. We also become an artillerist, giving us proficiency with woodcarver's tools, as well as two artillerist spells that we always have prepared. Shield adds 5 to our AC as a reaction, and Thunder Wave forces creatures in a 15-foot cube to make a constitution save, taking 2d8 thunder damage and being pushed back 10 feet on a fail, half damage and no pushing on a success. More importantly, we can make our own gun with Eldritch Cannon. As an action, we can make either a tiny or small cannon, choosing between a flamethrower, force ballista, or protector. Then we can activate it with our bonus action to produce some kind of effect. Uh, the flamethrower makes a 15-foot cone of fire that deals 2d8 fire damage on a failed dexterity save, half on a success. The force ballista fires a spell attack at a target within 120 feet, dealing 2d8 force damage on a hit and pushing the target 5 feet. And the protector gives itself and creatures of our choice within 10 feet of it 1d8 plus our intelligence modifier temporary HP. Whichever we pick, the cannon lasts for an hour or until it's destroyed and we can only summon it once per day, unless we burn a spell slot to summon it again. On top of the general gun theme, Artillerist is good for us because it lets us sneak in an extra thing that's in character, namely, wearing full plate armor. We aren't proficient with heavy armor, and we don't have the minimum strength requirement for full plate, so if we wear full plate, our speed is reduced by 10, we have disadvantage on ability checks, attack rolls, and saves using strength or dexterity, and we can't cast spells. But, summoning and activating our cannon doesn't count as casting a spell, and the only attack roll it can make uses our intelligence, so we can still attack pretty effectively and have 18 AC. It's still not a good idea to wear armor you aren't proficient in, but when has something being a bad idea ever stopped Dale from doing anything? Next we'll pick up the survivalist feat at 4th level. That'll round off our wisdom to 12, give us expertise in survival for some straight arrow training, and let us cast alarm without a spell slot once per day, so we can set up a security system for our house. For our 5th level artillerist spells, Scorching Ray throws 3 mini fireballs that each deal 2d6 fire damage on a hit, and Shatter deals 3d8 thunder damage to creatures in a 10 foot radius area who fail a constitution save, half damage on a success. 
Any creatures made of inorganic material, like metal or crystal, have disadvantage on their save. Both of those, as well as any of our other damaging artificer spells, can be enhanced if we cast them with our arcane firearm, a special rod or staff that we can make after a long rest. When we use it as a spellcasting focus for an artificer spell, the arcane firearm adds an extra d8 of damage to one of that spell's damage rolls. Jumping over to Bard for a bit, we get proficiency with keyboards and the performance skill to use them with, and Bardic Inspiration gives us a pool of d6s that we can pass out to our friends to help with their attacks, saves, and ability checks, just like passing out water on the football field. Jack of all trades lets us dabble in a variety of interests, adding half our proficiency bonus to any ability checks we make that don't include the full bonus. And Song of Rest lets us kick back with a keyboard and a beer, to heal us and our allies for an additional d6 when we spend hit dice during a short rest. The third level of Bard gets us two expertises, I'll say nature to know all about the creatures we exterminate, and history to know the laws of the land and figure out how to fight back against the man. Then we'll join the College of Whispers for Psychic Blades. Once per turn, when we hit with a weapon attack, we can spend a use of our Bardic Inspiration to deal an extra 2d6 psychic damage to the target. We're really here for Words of Terror, though. Once per rest, if we spend a minute talking to a creature alone, we can force them to make a wisdom save. Failing that, they're frightened of us or a creature of our choice for up to an hour. We can use this to interrogate people we suspect of being involved in conspiracies, or just to get Bill riled up and scared enough that he'll go along with our terrible plans. For our next feat, we'll lean into the exterminator bit with Poisoner. We get proficiency with Poisoner's kits, our poison damage ignores poison resistance, we can apply poison to a weapon as a bonus action rather than as an action, and we can spend an hour and 50 gold to make our own poison. We can make a number of doses equal to our proficiency bonus, and when a weapon coated in the poison hits a creature, they have to make a DC 14 constitution save or take 2d8 poison damage and be poisoned for a turn. Fifth level will finish up our bard levels by upping our bardic inspiration die to d8s, our psychic blades damage to 3d6, and refreshing our bardic inspiration on any rest with font of inspiration. Then, we'll head over to Rogue for proficiency and expertise in intimidation, as well as expertise in stealth. We can also pile on even more additional damage dice with Sneak Attack, adding an extra d6 of damage to our finesse or ranged weapon attacks, as long as we had advantage on the attack or we had an ally within 5 feet of the attack target. Second level rogues get Cunning Action, letting us disengage, dash, or hide as a bonus action so we can slip away from the cops, or run from the cops, or hide from the cops. Now, Dale likes to think of himself as the smartest guy in the group, and definitely smarter than the masses who believe whatever the government tells them, so we'll become a mastermind. Master of Intrigue gives us proficiency with the Disguise Kit and the Forgery Kit, as well as two languages. I tend not to talk about languages too much on this channel, unless they're especially relevant to the character, so go with whichever two you like, it really doesn't matter. Personally, I'd say Russian and Chinese, so Dale can always tell what any spies he might encounter are saying, but those aren't, like, actual D&D languages, so, you know, whatever. We can also pass ourselves off as a native speaker of a language if we listen to an actual native speaker for a minute and mimic their accent and their mannerisms. We do have to actually know the language as well, we can't just fake that. And we're a master of tactics, letting us take the help action as a bonus action. Additionally, if we help to attack an enemy, that enemy can be up to 30 feet away, rather than next to us. And our sneak attack damage goes up to 2d6. Our last level of Rogue will be dedicated to using our ASI to bump our Wisdom above 13, so we can multiclass into Cleric. Now, despite his distrust of the American government, Dale is actually intensely patriotic, so we'll go with the City Domain, since there's no Country Domain. That'll give us proficiency with Land Vehicles, the On-Off Cantrip, and two Domain Spells, Comprehend Languages and Remote Access. Comprehend Languages lets us understand any spoken or written language for an hour, though it doesn't let us speak or write them and Remote Access lets us use an electronic device within 120 feet as though we were touching it directly. Think of it like a clapper for your lights, or a voice command for your phone. City Domain Clerics also get Heart of the City, a number of times per day equal to our Wisdom modifier. When we make an Intimidation, Persuasion, or Deception check, we can get advantage on the check and count as proficient in the skill in question for that check. Second level Clerics can channel their divinity once per rest. All Clerics can turn undead, forcing all undead within 30 feet to make a wisdom save or run away from us for up to a minute, and city clerics can also use spirits of the city. As an action, we can make all city utilities within 30 feet of us either shut down or work perfectly for a minute. When we do, we can also force any enemies within 30 feet to make a charisma save. If they fail, each enemy is either knocked prone or restrained by utilities, like water spraying out of a fire hydrant, knocking them down, or 
the road collapsing under them, that sort of thing. At third level, we get two more domain spells. Find Vehicle summons up our Bugabago, and Heat Metal makes a metal object glow red hot for up to a minute, dealing 2d8 fire damage to any creature touching it. If they're holding or wearing the object, like a weapon or a suit of armor, they can make a constitution save to try to drop it, but if they fail, they have disadvantage on attacks and ability checks until our next turn. With our last ASI, we'll even out our Dexterity and Charisma to 14 and 16 respectively, then at 5th level, our turn undead automatically destroys any undead of CR 1 quarter or lower who fail their save, and we get more domain spells. Lightning Bolt blasts a 100 foot line with Lightning, dealing 8d6 damage to any creatures who fail a dexterity save, half on a success, and Protection from Ballistics gives us a bulletproof vest for resistance to non-magical ballistic damage. Our capstone is the 6th level of City Domain Cleric. We can use our channel divinity twice between rests, and with Block Watch, we are considered to have expertise in insight and perception, as long as we're within a city. Taking a look over at spells now, we ended up as a 14th level spellcaster. Both artificers and clerics prepare spells from their full list, but keep in mind that even though we have all the way up to 7th level spell slots, we can only prepare up to 2nd level artificer spells and up to 3rd level cleric spells. We can use the other slots to upcast them, we just can't prepare any further. For cantrips, Poison Spray is a nice little exterminator spray gun dealing up to 4d12 poison damage to a creature within 10 feet who fails a constitution save. Mending fixes small cracks and dents in objects, and also restores 2d6 HP to our Eldritch Cannon. We can use Prestidigitation for minor effects, like cleaning our clothes or lighting our cigarette, then Create Bonfire tosses that cigarette to make a 5-foot cube of flame that deals up to 4d8 damage to any creature who passes through it and fails a dexterity save. Now possibly the biggest reason that I wanted Bard levels was so we could pick up Dale's signature move, Pocket sand. No! Color Spray shoots a 15-foot cone of light that blinds 60-10 HP worth of creatures, starting with least HP and moving up. The best part? It's material components. It actually requires a pinch of colored sand to cast. Zone of Truth helps with interrogations, creating a 15-foot radius sphere of truthiness. Any creature that enters or starts its turn in the sphere makes a charisma save. If they fail, they can't deliberately lie while they're within the zone though they know that they're affected, and they can be evasive or, you know, just not answer any questions. Arcane Lock helps us to secure our house against the enemy, sealing a door or window magically. Now, we can still open it normally, as can anyone we designate, like Nancy or Joseph or John Redcorn. And we can set up a password as well, but otherwise the spell lasts until it's dispelled. We can use Clairvoyance like a surveillance camera, creating an invisible sensor we can see or hear through at a location we're familiar with. We can watch the outside of our house, or... Spy on Hank, he's definitely plotting against us. And for another exterminator spell, we'll grab Stinking Cloud for a big bug bomb, summoning up a 20-foot radius cloud of poisonous smoke that heavily obscures the area. Any creature caught in the cloud has to make a constitution save each turn that they're in it. On a fail, they spend their action that turn coughing and choking on the smoke, though they can of course still move to try to get out of the area. Now that the build is complete, the question becomes, how good is it? Well, we're pretty good at crowd control and debuffing. Stinking Cloud in particular is great for denying creatures their action, and we can use Spirits of the City to restrain them or knock them prone and just stick them inside the cloud. We're also decent at dealing with single enemies, since we have ways to boost our spell damage or add extra damage dice to our weapon damage between our arcane firearm, sneak attack, psychic blades, and poison or poison. Just one of our pistol shots can deal 1d10 plus 5d6 plus 3 damage, while also forcing a save that can deal an additional 2d8 damage. And we're surprisingly toolboxy, by which I mean we have something for every situation. We have a ton of utility spells, a bunch of skills and expertises, jack of all trades, and ways to either get advantage on our own checks or buff our allies' checks with bardic inspiration and the help action. Not to mention the literal actual toolbox that is right tool for the job. On the other hand, we are heavily multi-ability dependent. Literally none of our classes overlap their multiclassing minimums, so our highest scores are 16s in Intelligence and Charisma. That also means our spellcasting is both complicated and not very good, since we have three different spellcasting scores, which are all pretty low. Also, our pocket sand drops off in effectiveness pretty sharply when we start facing enemies with decent HP. Even if we use our 1 7th level slot to cast it, we affect, what is that, 18d10 HP, which is an average of only around 100 HP. And finally, we're probably going to get hit a lot. Dale doesn't wear armor, except when he does, and I already talked about the problems with that, 
and we didn't get any kind of mage armor or unarmored defense, so our AC is a solid 12. So, fun fact, at the time of this recording, I'm actually playing this build in my current game, and it is a ton of fun. I've greatly enjoyed spouting off random conspiracy theories, and then either by DM decision, good instincts, or just sheer dumb luck have 80% of it all come true. And I always have something to do, even if that something is as simple as just shoot the enemy. That said, it definitely benefits from heavy roleplaying, which, again, I can't really build into this build, that's all on the player. And I have been a single death save away from dying on one or more occasions, so do be ready for that. It is a lot of fun, though. Um, hi. Afternoon. Kate. I hope you enjoyed the build. If you have any feedback or suggestions for characters you'd like to see me build in the future, please leave them in the comments below. Leave a like or subscribe if you want to see more, and if you want to support what I'm doing here, you can check the description for the link to my Patreon, for access to my Discord channel, early access to future builds, and patron-exclusive content. Thank you for watching, friends. I will see y'all later.